Hey everybody, and welcome to the Behind the Scenes of The Haunting, Part 1. The first and most obvious uh, VFX shot that people will remember from Haunting was in Episode 1, with the Endless Corridor sequence. We want to open up the series with a decent exploration of just how deep and twisty and winding the interior of the TARDIS can really get, and the best way to really sell that was to use a form of non-Euclidean geometry, which is to say, make the camera do a thing that makes absolutely no sense in normal space. So at one point in the course of the big fly around through the corridors, we actually see it go around a complete flat loop several times before actually reaching an end. And you might expect that this was done using some repeating footage or some uh, camera jiggery pokery, but in actual fact this was no VFX, this was completely vanilla Minecraft. This was done with one simple practical effect that we just slightly hid with the camera angles. So what we did was we made a structure of the different corridor segments and then we made those into a structure file that we could use from the structure blocks that were in part of vanilla Minecraft. Then as the characters moved around the shot we were able to change out which section of the corridor was visible, and consequently create a complete loop from a entryway on the left to a exit on the right. This gave us the full and complete effect of a complete and total loop. After that, there wasn't really very much inside of Episode 1 that was uh, particularly special. In Episode 2, however, we also didn't have very much, but we had we did have a fairly important notion with regards to the camera. Now in replay we can put the camera basically everywhere that, everywhere and anywhere that we could possibly want, but we wanted to make sure that there was some meaning to it. We didn't want to move the camera unless the camera motion had some kind of value to it. We didn't want to position the camera unless it got away with a certain kind of tone or sensation, that kind of thing. And in that case, we have an episode here that is 90% just two characters having a conversation in different rooms. So it didn't really make sense for us to have just a locked backward and backward and forward kind of shot because it would just be very boring. So we tried to use the camera as an indicator of how much agency individual characters actually have inside of the scene. So for example, the camera when it's looking at lying, never lying, is always above making him seem smaller in the shot and with the witch it's always below which gives us this kind of down and deep kind of sensation and also makes the witch seem larger than never, which thereby tells you that the witch has more agency and control in this particular scene. Other than that, the one VFX shot that we had in this episode was the door opening right at the end, and this was possibly the simplest thing we could have done besides the endless corridor, because all that we had to do was just have somebody in shot who wasn't one of our actors open the door at the end of the film. And because replay allows us to just straight not render people, we didn't actually have any anything to really do there, but it's a nice effect nonetheless. Episode 3 is really where things start to get very interesting. The first and most obvious thing that people have to be, have to be considered with is the Phantoms of Martin and Walter, our uh, long absent supporting characters for Never Lying. And this took a lot of delicate balancing, because the first thing I had to do was block everything out into a step-by-step -step of who is involved. So we start with just Never, then we have Never and Walter, then we have Never, Walter, and Martin, and then we have just Never by himself again. So that gives me the transition points where I have to fade them in in some fashion, and for the most part they initially just pop in with uh, some very careful editing so that Never is never quite looking at wherever it is they're about to be. Uh, but when they actually vanish, they are directly on camera and we, just have, we, we have to try and transition them out in a nice, flavorful, uh, and visually impressive kind of manner. And this was done by masking out Walter and Martin individually, and then we used a expanding circular effect which allowed us to create a sort of uh, a ripple, more or less, that goes from their toes to their head. And then with that we just added this nice little uh, purpley smoke kind of effect on top that makes them look like they're vanishing completely. The next kind of thing that we have in episode 3 to talk about is the song. It's becoming a little bit of a trope, a recurring element if you will, for uh, stories in the Lineverse to be punctuated by dramatic songs. So especially with the ending of Witch in the Woods, there was a lot of music going on in that, and it wanted to be really brought back for this kind of season. So with that in mind, we picked the song of uh, Once Upon a Dream, which you might know from Sleeping Beauty, and it made a lot of sense to have that be involved here because it's uh, 
a an, an evil character bearing down on the good character and involves a lot of sleep. So makes sense for a lying in bed mon story. And initially we had this timed out during filming. We arranged the lighting rig so that somebody would be listening to me saying the song and walking forward and progressively the lights on both sides would get closer and closer off. Uh, this ultimately didn't quite carry when it was actually on film because the lights are initially so far away that there isn't really much update for Minecraft, and additionally, it was just very boring to be staring past someone's shoulder while they're turning around looking at things uh, the entire song. So it made more sense to have the lighting be punctuated as the character is moving around and as the song is done. Obviously, right after that, we have the fire. So there is a lot more fire, as one can presumably guess, uh, than was actually in the shot with this particular section. So. What we did to do this was we kind of went back to our tracking. We use replay mod to turn off lying, the same way that we turned off uh, our actor who was operating the door inside of episode 2. And then we also turned off all the particles, ramped up the brightness, everything, and that, made, that allowed us to get a hey, motion-matched copy of the footage that we were using in our final shot with lying. So from then, we were able to motion track and get everything positioned nicely, so we were able to just insert the fire. I tried to make it look reasonably pixelated. I don't know if I necessarily accomplished that, but I did manage to make it look a lot more on fire. Uh, the hard part here that I realized, unfortunately, after the fact, is that we didn't film Never Lying himself on a green screen, so instead of keying out the green around him, I actually had to go through the shot and then trace and mask out wherever he was, which was very time consuming, and that is why people prefer to, uh, to pr prefer to use chroma keys today rather than rotoscope, which is what that is. The last and perhaps slightly more impressive effect for this episode was the teleportation effect at the end, when we see a sort of almost third, like first person view of what it's like to teleport between two areas from Witch's perspective. Now, originally this was planned to just be a static shot from very next to the Witch, uh, where the world transforms around them, and ultimately this proved to just be kind of dull. Uh, we could have very easily just have had the witch on a green screen and then just faded the background, and it really wasn't very interesting at all. So instead, we started off with two motion-matched shots, one of the actual control room in the TARDIS and one of the prison in Otherware, neither of them with the witch involved, and then we got one of the witch themselves inside of a green screen where we uh, crunch the stone and where we actually teleport. And then we stitch those together so that the witch is directly on top, and then we motion track the where the witch is in their own little green screen shot. So that means that we now have motion matched all three of them, and we have a motion track that works from all three of them. And that allows us to paste wherever we want the, uh, the, the, the ripple of the teleportation effect to be exactly where the witch is in center. So consequently, as we are moving around and that ripple is growing larger, we get more and more of the TARDIS control room where there was the other way of prison. Add on some smoke, and uh, we can do that, do that just by grabbing the same assets from the phantoms, and everything looks pretty dang nice. And now episode 4. Now, it's fair to say that episode 4 has more VFX shots than almost all of the preceding episodes combined, uh, but only a few really are something pivotal or that we haven't already seen. So the first and most obvious is the tilting corridor effect. Now this was a mixture of practical effects using actually rotated versions of the set, so you can tell occasionally the textures on the wall blocks will change around a little bit, they'll rotate, uh, but nonetheless, it's, it, it gives away enough effect that things are actually rotating. And the rest of that was we used green screening. So we used the camera inside of the replay shot and we just rotated that in the actual uh, output from that. And then we've got a green screen of Never as well. And we rotated that in the same way. So that gave us match motion and allowed us to stick Never in there and have them rotate with the entire thing. Originally, we intended for Lying to actually just be in the same orientation until the shift finished, as is sort of the way things go in modded Minecraft when you have a, mo a moving multi-block structure. It will stay perfectly rotating nicely, but whoever's on it will usually just be rendered as normal, that means they just don't rotate at all. But uh, this proved to be a bit more incongruous than actually just having uh, never rotate along with the structure. The second effect, of course, is the witch teleporting behind Never. By now, you're maybe getting 
uh, an understanding of how these teleportation effects work, but uh, we just had a, gl a clean plate there without lying, and then a clean plate without the witch, and then we had a final plate with both that we cut to at the end whenever the uh, teleportation effect is done, which makes everything render out a little bit faster. Uh, generally speaking, After Effects will render at its highest speed if it's doing the minimum of work. So that's kind of an important thing when you're dealing with VFX heavy shots. So then we just mask around the area around Lang's shoulder so that we have a sort of view to where the witch's footage will be, and then we just apply our familiar teleport effect to the witch, and boom, there they are. The first shot that we actually planned for VFX in this entire series was the pool ceiling. So as Neva runs into the swimming pool, where the witch doesn't really want to be because, believe it or not, they're still not comfortable with water, um, we made an original green screen intentional kind of ceiling that had glowstone blocks behind it so that they would actually uh, light it up and give it a nice clean green, but ultimately the effect didn't quite carry because it was two very hard uh, contrast colors of green. Uh, so, in the end, we actually just removed the ceiling, um, which somewhat defeated the point of us actually having the green screen effect in there at all, but what's actually the case inside of the filming world is that we had the end biome everywhere, and the reason we had that was because the end doesn't rain, there's no storm weather inside of the end, which would have been a really huge pain to deal with in some of our shots, to just suddenly have a whole ton of water particles, uh, to have the rain in the background, that kind of thing, it just wouldn't have done, so we had to play in the end biome. And the end biome's sky is distinct, which meant that we had to actually replace the sky with a different sky. Uh, this particular one being just a regular old plains biome. And that ultimately, as one might expect, made it look like, they ha like we hadn't actually done any effects at all. So it made it look too normal, too dull, too easy, really. So we added on the grid lines, which are between the sky and the actual set. So it actually has to be like a whole green screened thing. Uh, but it implies a sort of a projection, a free, maybe a hologram or a 3D image kind of thing, or just an array of monitors that are really, really smart about where they're, what they're projecting and where. And I wanted to have this in. It's a bit of like a centerpiece kind of moment, but I wanted to have that full 3D sky displayed on the ceiling in the TARDIS because it's impossible, and it really bears out how how strange being in the TARDIS always is. Even when you have a brief moment, whenever, whenever you're being traced by an eldritch monstrosity or whatever, the TARDIS is never normal. The TARDIS is completely strange, and being in there is just one headache after the next. And so being indoors and yet seeing a complete three-dimensional sky above you seems like a nice thing to add on. And it also gives Never a nice moment of, uh, a, a moment to breathe where he actually gets to see the sky, because Never doesn't get to see the sky very often. The last time he saw a sky was in the course of the return, where we notably find him standing outside the TARDIS for a bit. The last effect that's particularly noteworthy inside of episode 4 is when we rack focus from Never in the swimming pool room to the sign that says no running, which you can take to mean in a variety of different metaphorical ways, but uh, rack focus to define it is when you change the focus point of a camera whilst you're filming something, uh, which causes what was previously the center of attention in the shot to become blurry and something new to clear up. And this is chiefly used when you're filming across two different actors who are having an, an interaction or some kind of relation inside the scene, uh, so you can make one of them seem to be uh, in focus and then you can change between the two without having to have a different shot. And it's also really useful when you're trying to indicate what's specific element of the environment a character is paying attention to. In this case, the sign that says no running. This is unfortunately fundamentally impossible in most video games, because almost universally everything in a video game is rendered crystal clear. There is no blur. There are some mods that can add in the effects. Uh, Optifine does that a fair bit in Minecraft, but you have to actually be pointing, you can't just move it in the shot. And a few other games will try to simulate it, but most games just do away with the idea completely. And there's no, even if there was, there's no way to just change the focus inside of inside of the actual video whilst you're doing it. So, consequently, we had to create this entirely in post. And to do so, we just had ourselves a very, very blurry matte circle. And then we just had the empty portion of that be used as part as a mask for a blur adjustment layer, which allows us to make the rest of the scene look very blurry. And we just moved the center of the circle 
down to the no running sign, and that allowed us to very gently fade in the blur so that you didn't initially notice it, and then at just the right time, have it move from being on never to move to the sign, so then never becomes blurry, the sign comes into focus. And that allowed us to get a nice visual means of, of displaying a thought process that's going on in, in Never's mind that we're not fully vocalizing. And that's it for this section of the behind the scenes of the Haunting Dune special. Hope you've all enjoyed, and I'll catch you all with part two. Catch you next time.